Welcome back. We're going to start uh, our discussion on a brand new topic called stereochemistry. Now, because of time constraints that we traditionally have in classroom setting, it may not be possible to teach you everything there is about stereochemistry in a short amount of time. So the video would just help you understand the foundational principles of stereochemistry and why it's, it's important to learn this and what practical issues there is associated with stereochemistry. So with that said, let's get started. Stereochemistry is basically a branch of chemistry that deals with how atoms are arranged three-dimensionally in a molecule. The three, normally when we, when we write chemical reactions, chemical structures, we're writing them on a piece of paper, so we cannot actually write write it in a way that still it contributes a three-dimensional view. Even though we write 3D structures, we're still writing it in 2D. But the actual molecule itself exists in three dimensions, okay? So if you are familiar with it, if I had given this molecule to you in our 170, 175 class and had you write the decrypted code and come up with the electron geometry, most likely you would have said tetrahedral and the code was AX4. And most of you had probably, if you had learned it correctly, would have drawn a structure that looks like that. Now, does it exactly look like this? Well, this is how we try to write structures on a piece of paper. But again, at 170, 175, we were not particularly interested in the three-dimensional arrangement. We were okay with you doing this, but we're one step ahead now. So this molecule does not actually look like this. It's three-dimensional. So what does this mean? That means carbon has four bonds, each attached to hydrogen, right? Two are in the plane of paper. I purposefully gave the background a white color, like a white paper. You see that two of the hydrogens that are with the regular line bonds, they are in the plane of the paper, that it's in line with, with the screen where the paper is that you're looking at. Whereas the other two hydrogens, one is coming into the plane, which is usually the one that's blackened out bond, and then there's one that's coming out of the plane that we can show on a paper, but the only way we can say that one is coming in and in plane, one is out of the plane is through the wedge bonds. Okay, so this is in, that's out. Right, if you think about a tripod that you use to take your photos with, only two legs can be seen at a time from one angle and one is always away. So the, well, if you have a four leg tri tripod, that would not be called tripod, that would be called a quadrupod, right? So if you imagine if you have a four leg quadrupod to load your camera, then only two could be any time in your vision, the two is always away from your vision. One usually will be coming into the quadrupod, one is away. That's exactly what's happening here because methane has four hydrogens. So the two regular bond lines are usually in plane, which are these. These are in plane. That means it's in the plane of the paper in which it's drawn. This is coming into the plane. This is coming out of the plane. That's really what it means, okay? Now, what does this do? What does this three-dimensional aspect does? It leads to the formation of stereoisomers, okay? R and S. I think I mentioned the rationale about um, an issue that was prevalent in Germany at the start of our organic class, okay? R means clockwise rotation. Yes means counterclockwise. What does this mean? There's an instrument called polarimeter, which when you have an organic molecule and it's dissolved in some kind of a liquid, usually water, and it's put into, or if it's nonpolar, then it's put in a nonpolar solvent, but it doesn't matter. It's put into this instrument and it shines light on the molecule. And if the light rotates clockwise, 
okay, if the light rotates clockwise, then the molecule has an R conformation. If the light rotates counterclockwise, okay, then the molecule has an S conformation. So that's where the R and the S comes in is, what does this lead us to? What causes this R and S? Just because it's three dimensional, does it automatically mean R and S? No, there's an important concept that determines whether the light rotates clockwise or counterclockwise in a polarimeter, and that concept is chirality. What is chirality? It's not just the three dimensional arrangement of atoms, but when you have a carbon with four different groups attached to it, that's called chirality. That's why I gave you a three-dimensional image, but this methane, CH4, is not chiral, is not chiral. You can call it achiral. Because each carbon, there's only one carbon and a methane, and they have four identical groups, so it's not chiral. But what is chiral is carbon with four different groups attached to it. Let's say you have a carbon with fluorine, Cl, say a hydrogen, and say a Br attached to it. Those are four different groups, okay, attached to it. So this carbon is a chiral carbon, and chirality is usually indicated by an asterisk sign, which we will do actually when we do a problem. This is an introductory video, so I don't want to keep it too long. So no chirality means no R and S isomers. So you must have a chirality to even have R and S. If you, there is no chirality, there is no R and S. It's just that simple, okay? And what is chirality? Every carbon, a molecule must not have every, there's not a requirement that every molecule have every carbon that's chiral. No, that's not a requirement. But if there is a carbon that's chiral, then that chiral carbon can be an R or an S. So let's say you have four carbons in a molecule. One could be R, other could be S, one could be R, the other could be S, or all could be R, all could be S. There's different combinations of it, okay? So what are some key ideas that are pertaining to the idea of chirality in stereochemistry? One is enantiomers, diastereomers, identical, meso, and constitutional isomers. And then these are all part of the idea of conformational isomers. These are constitutional. This is what we've already learned, where you have the same formulae. Constitutional isomer is same formulae, but different structure, right? We've already learned this. So we're not gonna spend time learning that again, different structure. That's constitutional. Conformational has to do with R and S. So that's what we're gonna learn. But this is introductory video and we have still not conclusively established the idea of R and S. So that's what we're gonna learn. Once you actually know how to do R and S, the rest of the stuff is, trust me, super easy. Even establishing R and S is easy because I'm using a method established by a person and I think he made life simple. So because keep in mind, we don't have a polarimeter in our classroom. So we must use some artificial ways of getting this information. So the takeaway from this video is, if your carbon in a molecule, if one carbon that you're looking at does not have four different groups attached to it, then that carbon is not chiral. What that means is, let's say I draw this one, say fluorine, Chlorine is attached to this, okay, this carbon. But then say I have one hydrogen and the other is also fluorine. Now you see there's two identical. All four must be different. There's no exception that can I have two same, two different, no, all four. So this is not a chiral carbon, not chiral. This is chiral because it has all four different carbons. So we usually indicate the carbon that's chiral with a star. All right, so I don't wanna say anything more than this. There's one more information that is, this is something we will come back and I will not give this formula on an exam. How many stereoisomers are possible? That depends on how many chiral carbons you have. Let's say for example, 
your compound contains four chiral carbons, okay? So how many different combinations of the R and S is possible? All you have to do is two to the four. That means you can get 16 possibilities, right? That's the formula. This is how many stereoisomers possible. Again, we can do this a little bit more as we learn the concept, but I want you to leave that video leave this video with that information so I can, when I come back, I can establish a connection, all right? So what is this N value? Total number of chiral carbons, all right? So stay tuned for more videos.